Greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, welcome to Investigator Insights. My name is Brad Monk. I'm the Director of Gynecologic Oncology here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. And it's my honor to discuss with you the therapeutic potential of novel PARP inhibitors in the Clinic for Improved Management of Epithelial Ovarian Cancer. I'm here to tell you that this is a new era. We have broken through finally... Uh, it's been since 2006 since we have had new, a new agent approved in epithelial ovarian cancer. Over the last eight years, uh, many of us on this call and around the world have been trying to bring new agents to our patients with uh, newly diagnosed and recurrent epithelial ovarian cancer. So you're going to see that in the next three or four months, we're probably going to have two FDA approvals. We'll talk about that as we move forward. My focus today is on PARP inhibitors, but I'm going to kind of work to put these uh, into context uh, because there's a lot going on uh, in this space. Uh, this first slide shows a newly diagnosed patient. You can tell that this patient has carcinomatosis but limited to the pelvis. You can see in the middle is the uterus. This patient lends itself to a surgical debulking but illustrates the point of tumor heterogeneity. Each one of these nodules represents an independent clone and this is a significant issue when we treat epithelial ovarian cancer. I'm not going to talk about surgery much, but this slide shows the importance of what we say is complete resection. We used to word, use the word optimal, optimal being less than 10 millimeters of residual disease. There is nothing optimal about leaving residual cancer. If you want to continue to use that term, optimal is complete resection. Here you can see that uh, based on a set of uh, European studies, that when there's complete resection, zero millimeters of residual disease, that the progression-free survival and the overall survival results are dramatic, and perhaps you can even cure these patients with, with advanced disease, you can also see the very small impact between greater than 10 millimeters and 1 to 10 millimeters in residual disease. So in order to put PARP inhibitors into context, I'm going to talk about three uh, uh, controversies, uh, emerging topics, if you will, new adjuvant chemotherapy, weekly chemotherapy, and intraparent neochemotherapy, and then finish talking about these new targeted therapies focusing on uh, PARP inhibitors. So new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, is here to stay. Basically, as presented here in the CHORUS trial in 2013 at ASCO, uh, the idea of beginning with chemotherapy rather than surgery. So the surgery then is what we call an interval debulking procedure. The CORUS trial is a randomized phase three trial taking patients with widely metastatic disease, patients that were generally of a poorer performance status than we generally see and also older. So this is not a universal strategy, but a common strategy. And in order to make sure that these were ovarian cancers, the serum C 125 CEA ratio was greater than 25, and many of these patients had a core biopsy, and all of them had at least a needle biopsy. And here you can see that, if anything, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and interval debulking surgery was uh, at least as good, maybe even a little better, than primary debulking and adjuvant chemotherapy. And then when added to the 2010 EORTC results published in the New England Journal, you can see that there really is a trend to improved outcomes. Remember, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is associated with fewer ICU admissions when the surgery is done, fewer blood transfusions, fewer bowel resections, and importantly, a higher uh, chance of complete resection. Weekly chemotherapy is, is not here to stay. It is still an emerging concept. You're familiar with the Japanese study. Um, uh, we did a study within the gynecological oncology group, which is not published yet, which was the same as the Japanese study where paclitaxel was given weekly at 80 milligrams per square meter. 80 times 3 is 240. That's a dose intensification compared to the every three-week regimen of 175 milligrams. So it was weekly and dose-dense. This differed, though, from the Japanese results in that bevacizumab was elected. The reality is, when bevacizumab was provided by the National Cancer Institute, most individuals agreed to use it because I think it's safe and effective in the frontline setting. But this frontline study showed that weekly dose-dense paclitaxel used with two, three-week carboplatin was not better 
with regards to progression-free survival compared to the Q3-week regimen. Remember, most of these patients got bevacizumab. So this is in contrast to the Japanese study results that you all know, and in fact, some of you practice dose-dense weekly paclitaxel up front. Remember I said that most patients in this trial chose Bev. Well, there were 112 patients that did, did not receive bevacizumab based on the investigator. Um, it was a stratification factor, so these arms are well-balanced. So in the patients that didn't get bevacizumab, the progression-free survival was superior to carboplatin and weekly taxane therapy. So I'm going to say it again. So Japanese data suggests that there's a survival advantage when weekly is used. The GOG in presented but unpublished data shows that when bevacizumab is in the mix, it's not better implying that Q3 week with BEV is the same as weekly with BEV frontline. But when bevacizumab is taken out of the mix, weekly still has the same results as the Japanese trial. So the conclusions are, I wouldn't use weekly and BEV together frontline. Is weekly without BEV frontline equal to Q3 week with BEV? I can't say that we can conclude that from this trial, uh, but I think that when making this decision, one needs to integrate the adverse events, and as you can see, that um, uh, when you use uh, the Q3 week regimen, there's less anemia, but that's a trade-off with more neutropenia, and there is uh, uh, less neurotoxicity in that Q3 week regimen, so the Q3 week regimen is maybe better tolerated, except for neutropenia. Okay. So we'll see when this is published, how this changes practice. Uh, we're writing the paper as fast as we can. So intraperitoneal chemotherapy continues to be an emerging topic. I just show you here GOG-252, uh, which will answer this question, I always thought, in a definitive qu uh, uh, setting. The study completed enrollment almost three years ago, but all these patients also get frontline bevacizumab. So We'll see, based on the prior results, whether bevacizumab is important. But this is basically weekly carboplatin and, excuse me, weekly paclitaxel and IV carboplatin, ARM1. ARM2, the same dose-dense weekly IV paclitaxel, but the carboplatin is placed in the belly. And then ARM3 is the old GOG-172 regimen with a little dose reduction for tolerability. And, it, again, that's cisplatin. So this trial should mature, you know, next year, and we'll have some exciting results. So let's now uh, talk about what we're perhaps most excited about, targeted therapy. And, you know, it's been 13 years since Bob Berger and I uh, uh, initiated the uh, uh, anti-angiogenesis uh, work. Um, you're familiar with the four approvals, uh, excuse me, the three approvals uh, in the EMA, frontline, platinum-resistant, platinum-sensitive disease. Uh, we have no approvals here, although the platinum-resistant strategy has been filed here in the United States to the U.S. FDA. That study is called the Aurelia trial. Um, the What we call the PDUFA action date, which is the deadline, if you will, for the FDA to make its decision, uh, is November 17, 2014. So that's just around the corner. There's been no announcement of an ODAC on bevacizumab in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, and the FDA review was given a priority uh, review. So I think all of us assume that by the middle of November or so, we'll have FDA approval for bevacizumab in platinum-resistant recurrent epithelial ovarian cancer. I think the reason that it's been so slow is that we don't have a molecular marker you probably saw this at ASCO, uh, but if you didn't, uh, these were subgroups of high-grade serous ovarian cancer uh, studied uh, in Scotland uh, with an Australian uh, and European collaboration, uh, taking macrodissected tumors, isolating the mRNA, and looking at a microarray. And here you can see that they were able to divide the tumors into three categories what they call an angio subgroup, an immune subgroup, and an angioimmune subgroup, and, and suffice it to say that they were able to uh, look at this uh, uh, 
gene expression profile and show that it was predictive of progression and overall survival in in various subgroups, the subgroups that I showed two slides earlier, with the immune subgroup having the uh, best prognosis. And this is the 63 gene signature, um, and, and they're able to uh, uh, use that to find this immune subgroup. And uh, it, again, it, it was validated in even a third, what we call the Tot Hill database, looking at the immune subgroup having an improved prognosis for progression-free survival and overall survival. Uh, this gene expression profile should be commercially available here very soon in Europe. They wanted to see if bevacizumab had anything to do with that. Uh, remember that probably the biggest reason we haven't had a bevacizumab approval here is because of the lack of a biomarker. And uh, they hypothesized this is, that this immune subtype was characterized by the absence of an angiogenic biology and that this subgroup would not benefit from angiogenic agents. And maybe this immune subgroup could show that uh, bevacizumab should not be used. So they looked at the ICON-7 trial, which was a study published in uh, the New England Journal, uh, performed in Europe, really complementary to our study, GOG-218. Uh, and they were able to show, uh, again, that it was prognostic, and now in this fourth subgroup, uh, the immune uh, showing an, a, a better progression-free survival, again, a 63-gene uh, expression profile, prognostic for progression-free survival and overall survival, and, and interestingly showed, as the hypothesis was, that the immune subgroup patients had an inferior progression-free survival when treated with bevacizumab. So again, this is just the immune subgroup, and on the left, uh, uh, you can see the uh, 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 progression-free survival in this immune subgroup, and on the right, the non-immune subgroup. So in the non-immune subgroup, uh, Bevacizumab helped, but it would it hurt in the immune subgroup. The immune subgroup was 41% of the patients, so uh, this is uh, interesting. And and here's the overall survival uh, in that that those same two uh, uh, analyses, really showing a worse survival in the immune subgroup that received bevacizumab. So the good news is is that the immune subgroup has a better prognosis. The bad news is that if you use bevacizumab in that setting, you may actually be hurting those patients. So that's all I'm going to talk about, about anti-angiogenesis therapy. And I use the word anti-angiogenesis because it's not just an anti-VEGF world. There are other angiogenesis drivers, such as angiopoietin 1 and 2 and terbananib. You've heard about that. Um, but I'd like to transition, uh, really, for the rest of the talk uh, about uh, uh, PARP inhibitors, and that's the next wave. So angiogenesis was first, PARP inhibitors is second, and then the third wave will be immunotherapy. Maybe you can join me another time for an immunotherapy discussion. But uh, it, this uh, uh, PARP inhibitor world really started with the awareness that the only biomarker that we have in epithelial ovarian cancer is BRCA1 and 2. These are tumor suppressor genes inherited in a dominant function, the risk of ovarian cancer is higher in BRCA1 than 2, uh, and the phenotype associated with these are mostly high-grade serous cancers, but occasionally high-grade endometrioid tumors. And I think you need to know that the NCCN recommends germline testing for BRCA1 and 2 mutations in any woman with ovarian cancer, regardless of family history. So that, that's important. So... The data that I'm going to show you with PARP inhibitors is in recurrent ovarian cancer. I think you need to ask yourself when patients recur, and this is the old definitions of optimal, meaning that they had between zero and one centimeter of residual disease and suboptimal, meaning greater than a centimeter. But when patients recur depends on the amount of residual disease, and you can see that it's basically one to two years. Okay, So patients recur when they get platinum taxane combination in one to two years. And if they have gross residual disease or stage four, they all recur. Okay. So when we see these recurrent patients, there are a number of factors to consider. Uh, the treatment-free interval is the simplest, and that's the time from stopping 
platinum. When we use maintenance bevacizumab, that doesn't change the time from the platinum. The number of prior regimens is important in considering recurrent cancers, and certainly how the patient's feeling and doing in in the bulk of the disease and whether or not she's symptomatic. And this has really generated this approach where patients who recur within the first six months are generally treated with a non-platinum agent. The non-platinum agents are really one of three. You could say there's a fourth. I think there's only three. Uh, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, given at 40 milligrams per square meter, IV every four weeks, not 50, as it's FDA approved. Weekly paclitaxel at 80 milligrams per square meter, three out of four weeks, okay? So it's not every week. And then topotecan, given generally for five days, given generally at 1.25 milligrams per square meter, not the 1.5 as is labeled. Now, while three of those, and gemcitabine would be the fourth, and I don't think gemcitabine has has the same activity, and certainly it's not FDA approved in that setting like the other two regimens in platinum-resistant disease. And if you want to add bevacizumab in platinum-resistant recurrent cancer, that's fine. And as I told you, in the next month, it's likely to be FDA-approved based on the Aurelia trial, and look for it. In the platinum-sensitive setting, it's a platinum doublet. The most common platinum doublets are also threefold. Carboplatin used with gemcitabine, which is the last FDA approval in 2006. Carboplatin pegylated liposomal doxorubicin based on the Calypso trial, which compared it to carboplatin paclitaxel, which is the third regimen. Carboplatin gem, carboplatin PLD, carboplatin paclitaxel, and carboplatin PLD compared to paclitaxel was superior for PFS. And again, those can also all be used to bevacizumab. Uh, the most common would be with gemcitabine, according to what's called the OCEANS trial. Uh, that is a label that indication within the EMA, but certainly not in this, in this country. This slide shows this uh, more schematically. Uh, and, and you, you sometimes you hear about the 6- to 12-month platinum free interval group as being partially platinum sensitive. Maybe that's a third group, and also the very sensitive patients that are maybe you know greater than 12 months. So since all of these patients with gross residual disease or uh, stage 4 disease recur, there's a lot of discussion about maintenance. The stakes are high. The standard treatment when a patient is in remission is observation. So when you look at a maintenance strategy, toxicities become even more important because the comparator is no treatment, okay? But nevertheless, because patients have a high response rate, even a high clinical CR and pathologic CR, their chance of recurrence is very, very high. And there are a number of maintenance strategies. Certainly, bevacizumab is one of them, and the frontline trial, GOG-218, used that, and certainly the OCEANS trial in platinum-sensitive disease uses that. You're familiar with the paclitaxel maintenance world. But probably the most important emerging maintenance strategy is PARP inhibitors, and that's what we're here to talk about. And we've already talked about antiangiogenesis therapy here on the left, but when we met in 2010 as a gynecologic cancer intergroup, a global research strategy and clinical practice paradigm defining group, we said, look, the two most important areas are angiogenesis and PARP inhibition. And as I said, the third one is going to be immunotherapy. So the the most recent maintenance anti-VEGF strategy is, as you uh, probably saw in this month's Journal of Clinical Oncology, uh, uh, two years of pizopinib. Uh, These were 940 patients in remission randomized to placebo or this oral medication, a rather dramatic improvement in progression-free survival of of 5.6 months uh, with no improvement in overall survival and a lot of toxicity. And so that was filed to the EMA and ultimately withdrawn because it was just not acceptable risk-benefit ratio uh, and was never filed within, within the U.S. When it comes to chemotherapy, the GOG has completed enrollment in a more definitive trial looking at a novel uh, taxane, a polyglutamated paclitaxel, a macromolecular paclitaxel, uh, and this is uh, compared to no treatment and to standard paclitaxel with a survival endpoint, so so look, look for that. As I mentioned, though, PARP inhibition is probably the leading maintenance 
approach. Uh, as you probably know, PARP is a DNA repair enzyme. It's recruited in the setting of DNA damage. Uh, it assembles uh, DNA repair factors and ultimately uh, leads to uh, a base excision repair. Um, and, and, and it's really been a whirlwind over the last nine years of PARP inhibitors in the clinic. And that PARP inhibitors can impact and help patients with epithelial ovarian cancer. And they can help either when added to a chemotherapy, what we call potentiation, or they can work individually, which is synthetic lethality, which uh, targets cells that already have impaired DNA repair pathways, BRCA germline mutation or somatic mutation carriers. And by targeting these defective cells, they can have a selective cell kill. And there are a number of them that are in the clinic. I'm going to focus on those that are in uh, phase three development. Um, uh, they have uh, dual activities. Uh, they uh, both uh, uh, trap uh, uh, PARP and also inhibit the catalytic enzyme. Uh, I have no idea which one is better. Uh, the, probably the three leading ones uh, that are in development or three of the four, I would say there's a fourth one, or Caprib, or Olaparib, Velaparib, and Neraparib. Uh, the Velaparib Phase three has not been launched, and I'm not going to talk about it. That's going to be a frontline trial. But in vitro, Neraparib uh, would be the most active, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But Olaparib really uh, uh, has been uh, the most studied. Uh, it's one of these uh, molecules that when they do the Phase one, it ends up in the New England Journal, uh, 2281, if you call it. And, and there has been a lot of work on elaborate. You're probably familiar with it. I talked about the phase one. Uh, the phase two looked at a dose finding and shows that the dose of the capsules, okay, eight 50 milligram capsules is 400 milligrams BID. The tablet dose in the phase three trials ongoing now use a tablet, not the capsules, is 300. Tablet 300, capsule 400 dose. And it even works in, in wild types and, 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 and because these patients have homologous recombination uh, repair uh, defects, and, and, and we'll see that. And we're going to talk about some combination studies and maintenance studies and, 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 um, uh, and also uh, a combination with anti-VEGF therapy. So I wrote combination study 41 here. I'm not going to show you that for the sake of time but I'm going to show you a combination sidereum trial. So in the beginning, uh, the question was, are PARP inhibitors, Olaparib, better than uh, chemotherapy? And, and the results of this trial actually interrupted the program. After seeing this, AstraZeneca said, you know, if it's not better, uh, we're not going to uh, study it further. Um, as I say all the time, if you can't beat something, then you could compete against nothing. And I already said that nothing is the standard in maintenance therapy, and that's why PARP inhibitors are a maintenance strategy. So this is the study that showed that Olaparib, single agent, in germline mutation carriers is not more effective. And again, they were unsure of the dose at this time. It's 400 versus 200. Uh, and then the higher dose of PLD, 50 milligrams, in germline mutation, mutation carriers with recurrent ovarian cancer. And you don't need a statistical function to see that these three lines are the same. And the, the, the investigators said, well, you know, Olaparib was not better than PLD, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, because PLD outperformed what we expected. What does that mean? PLD performs very well in BRCA germline BRCA mutant patients. Okay? All chemotherapy drugs almost at least those that are active in DNA, perform better in the germline mutation setting. So then people say, well, maybe, maybe the benefit of Olaparib is its tolerability, and this shows the adverse events. And it's true at the 400 dose, there were 38% any grade 3 uh, CTCAE adverse events compared to 69%, but, but most of these were the PPE, which you see there highlighted in yellow, 11%. Uh, I don't know if PLD at 40, which is the dose we use in the clinic, would be worse 
vanilaprib at 400 in the capsule formulation. This, remember here, the PLD dose was 50, and, that, and that's not what we use because of the um, um, risk of PPE. So I want to now talk to you about maintenance, because if you can't beat something, you should compete against nothing. And, and this is what we call Study 19. This has been published in the New England Journal now two years ago. The results of this study were presented to an Oncology Drug Advisory Committee, an ODAC, on June 25th, and the vote was against it, 11 to 2. So I'm going to show you these data. These data were rejected by ODAC, okay? However, the EMA uh, is reviewing this favorably, and this will ultimately be the European indication, study 19, okay? Um, and the, uh, again, the PDUFA action date, if you will, for Elabra by the FDA was October 3rd. It came and it went because after the negative 11 to 2 ODAC vote on this study 19, uh, AstraZeneca presented more data. There was a major amendment, which means probably a different indication. And the new PDUFA action date for Elaprib within the U.S. FDA is January 3rd. So think of that. I told you that the platinum-resistant deadline with bevacizumab is November 19th. And now the FDA deadline for Elaprib is January 3rd. Is it possible that after eight years of drought that we're going to have new, two new targeted therapies Approved uh, in the next three months, we'll see. So this is a maintenance trial. Patients who had up to uh, a two or greater platinum regimens who were basically in remission, uh, but it, some of them were PRs, randomized to a lab versus uh, placebo in a one-to-one -one randomization. These were all germline. These were not all germline mutation carriers. Okay, but most of them had high-grade serous cancers, and and you can see here that the intent to treat analysis. Uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.35. Pretty good, okay? All right? So um, pretty impressive. Again, published in the New England Journal. Glabrib is chemotherapy. It causes adverse events, predominantly GI-related. And the Glabrib GI adverse events are threefold, okay? Dyspepsia, which is not shown here. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And you can see that... The severe grade 3, 4 GI adverse events were uncommon, but certainly occur. And, and the most dramatic improvement in PFS uh, was uh, a, in the germline mutation carriers. Uh, the germline mutation carriers was 136 out of the uh, uh, entire uh, uh, population, about half. Um, and Hazard ratio is 0.18. You'll hear people say it was really 0.17 because when they redid the data for the FDA submission, it was 0.17. Pretty dramatic, okay? Improvement in PFS from 4.3 to 11.2 months. I can tell you there are other agents such as uh, terbectidin that when given to BRCA germline mutation carriers has a similar dramatic effect. So remember... Um, this is a highly select subset of patients, and I don't know that this result is better than or better tolerated than PLD, as I already alluded to, or even other DNA damaging agents such as terbectinin. And you can also see here that in the wild type, the orange versus the blue, that the hazard ratio is 0.53, but not quite as dramatic. So elaborate works as a maintenance strategy in platinum-sensitive recurrent and cancer, whether they're germline mutation carriers or not, but the hazard ratio is more dramatic in the germline mutation carriers. And in that germline group, there was a trend towards OS. So remember, it's only 136 patients. Uh, hazard ratio 0.74, but it looks pretty good. Small, small group of patients. Um, so some of us talk about the time to subsequent therapy, what we call PFS2. So the time that you can prevent patients from needing more traditional intravenous treatment. So if you got placebo, you started your next treatment uh, about 15 months later. And if you got a lap rib, you started your next treatment 23.8 months later. 
So there was an eight-month improvement in, in, in time off uh, uh, more traditional chemotherapy. Um, and again, that same difference was in the germline mutation carriers here shown in white, hazard ratio 0.46, and in the colored uh, 0.64. So other companies have taken that same strategy and uh, are doing uh, a, a randomized phase three trial. So certainly Elaborate, AstraZeneca, they're doing the same thing again. Study 19 like, and it's called Solo 2, and it's almost done. And But it's all germline BRCA mutants. The Raparib, which I told you at least in vitro is a little better, is doing the same thing. Um, but the Neraparib Nova trial is just like Study 19 because it's both mutant and wild type. Tesoro, the maker of Neraparib, says, look, if Study 19 was positive in both mutant and wild type cohorts, we want to show that our medication is also positive. Rapaparib, also uh, being studied in the same setting, um, uh, uh, looks at endometroid tumors. Um, the other two trials of Neraparib and Olaparib only look at high-grade serous tumors. And interestingly, uh, uh, Rapaparib in this phase three trial has an aggressive biomarker because uh, certainly uh, a biomarker might help figure out which of those BRCA wild type patients have HRD and are most likely uh, to respond. So here's a few more words about Neraparib. Um, as you can see in the phase one study, uh, particularly in that platinum sensitive cohort, that all but three patients responded. Okay, so uh, 75%. So, so these agents are really, really active in these groups of patients who have platinum-sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer. And again, here's the schema of the NOVA trial. Uh, the NOVA trial, very similar, uh, takes patients with no measurable disease uh, after platinum-sensitive successful treatment, divides them into two groups, the muta mutated groups on the left, the non-mutated groups on the right, and randomizes them two to one. Uh, uh, based on placebo in this trial is, is also almost almost done. This is the clinicaltrials.gov number for uh, uh, Aerial 3, the Recaparib made by Clovis. Uh, and then that was the platinum sensitive. Why not frontline maintenance? Oh, good idea. So Solo 2 is a Laparib and platinum sensitive maintenance. And Solo 1 is bracket mutant frontline maintenance. So you can see how active this space is. I just showed you four phase three trials. So I'm going to finish up here by talking to you about combinations. Uh, in vitro anti-VEGF therapy, okay, is synergistic to anti-PARP therapy. And just this last year at ASCO was a phase two trial comparing the combination of a lab rib uh, versus a lab rib in the anti-angiogenesis sidereum, which is an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And as you know, uh, they're owned by the same company, so you can combine them. Sidereum is a TKI against VEGFR123. The problem is, is it's pretty toxic, but it's active as a single agent, 17%. So we'll look at the toxicity data in a minute. Again, presented at ASCO, platinum-sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer. Remember, the standard treatment here is carboplatin gem, carboplatin PLD, or carboplatin paclitaxel. And again, in Europe, you can get BEV with that uh, on label. Uh, here, you can uh, use BEV, but it's not labeled. So there's no chemotherapy here. These are patients with measurable disease, and they're getting a lap rib or sidereal in a lap rib. And you notice that the lap rib dose in the combination is half, 200 milligrams. And again, this is the capsules. And in the phase three lap rib trials, we were using the 300 milligram tablets. And dramatically, okay, the combination was better, but the single agent elaborate was pretty good, nine months. And in fact, if you look at the response rate, single agent elaborate had a response rate of 43%. That's about as good as you could do with a platinum doublet. But sidereal elaborate was 68%. And that's dramatic. These are non traditional chemotherapy doublets. And, and interestingly, the real benefit of the sidereal combination was in the uh, non bracket mutants. In other words, if you got a BRCA mutant, laparib is good, probably good enough. But if you don't have a BRCA mutation, 
why don't you get a lap rib and sidereinib together? So the non-mutant patients is on the right, very dramatic effect with the addition of anti-VEGF therapy to part inhibition. Problem here is toxicity. And you can see in the combination, it's pretty doggone toxic with not only hypertension, but look, 23% grade 3 diarrhea. Listen, grade 2 diarrhea is even bad. So if you look at the, the diarrhea grade 2 and 3, you got 69%. Okay? Fatigue, also 54% grade 2 and 3 in the combination. So we need to get our handle, our brains around the toxicity here. And here's a slide summarizing that. No question the toxicity has increased. You know, they, this is right out of their ASCO presentation. The, di the diary was managed. I'm not sure it was managed successfully. But importantly, 77% of the patients on the combination had dose reductions, and four came off for toxicity, all in the combination arm. So we'll have to see. So I mentioned to you that the recaparib uh, is looking at, uh, phase three is looking at a biomarker. We need a biomarker, okay? Because it's not just the germline mutation mutations that lead to homologous recombination to repair. We have some somatic mutations, some hypermethylation, uh, and various pathways. And, and this concept of BRCA-ness has been explored in a gene expression profile in the JCO a couple, four years ago. Um, and, and we're going to get better at that. And this particular paper showed that this gene expression profile really was predictive of outcome and ideally it would be nice if it could be predictive of activity to PARP inhibitors. One of the questions that I get asked is what happens after being treated with a PARP inhibitor? I don't know. In other words, does treating with a PARP inhibitor during platinum-sensitive maintenance take some of the options down the line off the table? Remember, ovarian cancer is a sequence of treatments. It's not one treatment and done. And this is a group of patients um, uh, uh, who... Uh, 67 of them who were treated after a lap rib, and there was, you know, some good responses. 40% in the platinum-sensitive uh, uh, patients, or, or, or excuse me, 36% in post a lap rib treatment responded, and if you use platinum again, it was a 40% response rate. So the post lap rib response rate overall was 45%, and there were no, there was no evidence of of mutations that that uh, uh, as a result of the uh, a lap rib treatment. So this is where we are today. Um, SOLO-1, SOLO-2 are the elaborate trials. SOLO-1 is frontline maintenance. SOLO-2 is platinum-sensitive maintenance. And then we have the other two maintenance trials looking at niraparib and recaparib. But you can, you can ask yourself, right? I just showed you some fantastic data with sidereinib. Do you think that AstraZeneca is going to do a, a phase three with elaborate and sidereinib? I don't know. Stay tuned. How about, how about a lap rib and bevacizumab? Because bevacizumab is better treated than sidereinib. Hmm. I don't know. How about niraparib as a frontline maintenance strategy? I don't know. How about recaparib as a frontline maintenance strategy? I don't know. But you can probably assume that many of those proposed trials that I just mentioned are going to develop. And as we stand today, we have five, excuse me, four uh, randomized phase threes of PARP inhibitors. So look forward to the next couple of months. See what happens with bevacizumab in the platinum resistance space. Look what happens to the now the major amendment that has happened in Olaprib, January 3rd. Uh, it's been my pleasure to chat with you today. This is an exciting time in ovarian cancer, and thank you for allowing me to put PARP inhibitors into context. Greetings, and so long for now from Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs>